Um, and now, Dr. Wynn was born and raised on the Isle of Wight off the south coast of England and studied at the University College of London and the University of Edinburgh before setting out to Germany and North Carolina as a postdoc. His first faculty position was at the University of Western Australia, and then he spent 11 years at the University of Florida before he arrived at Arizona State University, his current home. At the University of Arizona, he is, in, he is the professor in the Department of Psychology as well as the director of the Canine Science Collaboratory. Uh, he's interested in the behavior of animals and the behavior of people towards non-human species. His current research focuses on those issues and the interaction of dogs and people. Thank you, and please welcome Dr. Wynn. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's great to be here. Um, as as uh, Victoria said, I just uh, moved here from I moved here. I moved to Arizona State University from the University of Florida just this past summer, and I'm very excited to be there. And uh, it's great to be your neighbor. And I hope we can hang out more together now that we're neighbors. There's no veterinary school at Arizona State University, so I don't have any veterinary friends to hang with there as I used to at the University of Florida. So as I'm sure you know, one of the leading preventable causes of death for dogs is euthanasia. <laughs> it's very, very hard to get solid numbers on this, but uh, more than 10% of the dogs living in the United States today are in shelters today. And that means we're talking probably about, you know, we're pulling numbers a bit out of thin air because there's no kind of national registry, registry. but we might be talking about 8 million dogs. And of those 8 million dogs, again, there's no national registry, we're just pulling numbers out of thin air. Some people say one in four, some people say half. If all of those dogs in shelters will end up euthanized because they cannot find human homes. And what is the leading reason why a dog can't settle in a home? Well, some of them are medically sick, which is your primary specialty, right? To treat the medically sick animals. But some large portion of them are not medically sick. They're just behaviorally unsuited to living in a human home. So I want to look at and talk to you a bit about the nature of dog behavior and how dog behavior comes to fit into human homes. And we have a lot of projects that we've done over the last, I don't know, seven or eight years, uh, my students and I, looking at different aspects of this kind of question. And I'm just going to throw a few of these at you today, see how much time I end up having. And what I don't cover today, you can invite me back next year and I'll tell you the rest then. Okay, so, let's see if I can make this work. There's a view out there. There's a view out there that you may have come across if you have watched a National Geographic TV special on dogs in recent years, or PBS special on dogs in recent years, or you've read this book or a number of other books that have picked up the same idea. There's a researcher at Duke University, Brian Hare, who claims that in the 15,000 years that dogs have been on this planet, since they were derived from their wild ancestors, the wolves, he claims the dogs acquired special cognitive skills in understanding us human beings that are unique in the animal kingdom. So Brian has this evolutionary family tree, and he talks about the evolution of human or human-like social skills, the ability to understand what human beings are up to. And quite self-evidently, almost by definition, we human beings are able to understand what human beings are up to. But Brian has tested our closest surviving relatives, the chimpanzee and the bonobo, and Brian says they don't get it. They don't understand human intentions. They don't have the cognitive apparatus to understand what people are up to. Meanwhile, over here, on a very distant branch of the evolutionary tree of mammals, there live dogs. And dogs do understand human actions. Meanwhile, the dog's closest living relative, the animal from which dogs are derived, the wolf, does not, says Brian. 
So when I first heard about this, I thought it seemed plausible enough. But shortly after we started studying dogs, we were invited to go out to Wolf Park in Indiana, where they've been hand rearing wolves since 1972. So they're really good at it. And it turns out to be very difficult. Uh, and so we had the opportunity to test wolves. So how do we measure whether an animal understands human intentions? What's become the paradigmatic test, and this is so easy, that you should go home and try it on your own dog or cat or whatever animal you live with. Child, if you have a child. Um, and all you need to do is to set down on the ground two containers and point at one of them. Keep the animal back. If your dog can do a sit-stay, you can just do this on your own. If your dog doesn't know a sit-stay or if you're here with some other animal, a child, uh, get somebody else, the other parent of the child, to hold the animal back while you point, and then release the animal, see if it goes where you point. If you try this with your dog, eight out of every ten of you will find that your dog goes where you point. If you try it with your cat, your cat will wander off in a completely different direction. <laughs> okay, so, Monique Udell, who's now at Oregon State University, which can't be all that far from here, and it would be by her. Uh, she carried out this kind of an experiment at Wolf Park, on wolves, and the wolves, even though they're hand reared, don't come indoors, so they were tested outdoors. And on this first visit, we were too scared of the wolves to go in the enclosure with them, so we had the staff of Wolf Park, people who were very familiar with the wolves, carry out the test for us. So I'm going to show you data from a group of wolves tested outdoors by a familiar person. We realized that although we were not the first people to test wolves, and not the first people to test dogs, nobody had tested dogs under conditions that matched exactly to the conditions under which wolves are by necessity tested, which is to say, outdoors by somebody who's familiar to them. So we actually used the dog's owners as our experimenters. It doesn't take long to explain to somebody how to point in the way we wanted them to, so we just took a couple of minutes to explain to each other this was at a dog park, People showing up at a dog park, big sign, free dog intelligence testing today. <laughs> Honestly, some people say, is it really free? Um, <laughs> so a great line of people, and we teach them one by one to point in exactly the manner that we have taught the staff at Wolf Park to, talk, to point to the wolves. Then what did we have? Then uh, we tested some dogs, because as... Uh, the results will show we were surprised by the outcome of this. We decided to test another group of pet dogs outdoors, but with a professional experimenter, Monique Udell, doing the pointing, to see if that could help us understand what was happening. Then, for comparison with other studies that have all been done with pet dogs in familiar environments, we tested a group of dogs indoors with a professional experimenter. And the other thing we did, which will be a useful segue, I get to it, is we went to our local county animal shelter and we asked them if we might please try this test on some of their dogs. This is an open access shelter. It's as well run as most county shelters, which is to say that it's a noisy, difficult place run by people who are stretched after it's a breaking point. Um, but, you know, we're doing a fantastic job under the most difficult circumstances. And so we went into their garage space and we tested the shelter dogs. We tested them indoors, and by necessity, they were tested by somebody unfamiliar to them. They, uh, they weren't people's pets, they didn't have any particular people with whom they were bonded. Okay, five different groups of animals. Remember, Brian Hare says dogs can do this as their birthright, they evolved to follow what people are up to. Wolves have not spent 15,000 years living alongside people. They cannot do it. Here are the wolves tested outdoors. We only give them 10 trials. We're not trying to teach them anything. We're just trying to ascertain what they already know. Randomly mixed up, five times to the left, five times to the right. Chance would be five out of 10. It would be like flipping a coin, 50-50. In point of fact, the wolves on average got about 75% correct, which is significantly above chance. So wolves can do this. I'm not saying every wolf can do this. Obviously, most wolves cannot do this. 
but a wolf that has been carefully hand reared by human caretakers who know how to do it, those wolves pay attention to people's actions as well as any of them. Dogs tested in a home can do this. I'm not surprised. I wasn't the first person to try this. Well established. Any idiot knows that their wolf, their, their, wolf, their dog, pays attention to their gestures. Not rocket science. But it gets interesting. Up. Test dogs outdoors. <laughs> they fall to chance. Now, I'm not saying dogs in general cannot understand people's actions and intentions if they're outdoors. That would be a foolish claim to make. What I am saying is that this particular population of dogs do not follow what people are doing when they're being tested outdoors. We've never really followed up on this. I don't quite know why not. But my strong suspicion is that since we were using a private pay-to-enter off-leash dog park, that those dogs we were testing <coughs> were probably not interacted with very much outdoors. This is a, back in Gainesville, Florida, a college town. The kinds of people that are likely to be interested in paying money to let their dog off leash probably live in apartments or small homes with only very small backyard areas, and probably uh, you know, college students. Dogs are locked in at home most of the time, and the dogs are not getting a lot of interaction outdoors. I don't doubt that we could find other populations of dogs that would be responsive to what people are doing when they're out. Dogs that live and work outdoors with people more, that would be my expectation. But the fact that I can find this group of dogs so easily, or this set of testing conditions so easily, shows that it cannot be something that is innately true of all dogs for all time. Yeah? Was that the same thing that's familiar and unfamiliar? Yes, it didn't make any difference. Yeah. But finally, what about the dogs at the shelter? The dogs at the shelter completely bond. And in fact, they look like they, they are performing worse than chance, but that does not mean that if I point to the left, they are more likely to go to the right, and if I point to the right, they're more likely to go to the left. What's actually happening is, it doesn't matter whether I point left or right, they don't go anywhere. They might come up to me and sit here and just look at me, or they might stay where they are and not understand that they need to approach me. They're not getting anywhere. So, the first take home from this is a take home about phylogeny and ontogeny, about evolution and individual development. That is to say, it is not the case that dogs evolved special skills in the 15,000 years since they split off from wolves. Because the wolves, <coughs> given the right circumstances, can actually do this. And dogs, under unfortunate circumstances, do not succeed. So it's not a difference between wolf and dog. It's all about what are your circumstances of life. So, this is where we can segue into talking about these shelter dogs. Because here they are performing abysmally badly. By the way, these dogs represent the proportion of animals tested that individually achieved a criterion of success. And so you can see that on an individual criterion, actually more wolves were successful than dogs, but those dogs that were successful performed at a higher level, so the average performance is about the same. Not a single shelter dog in this original study could understand what we were doing with our pointing. One way of understanding that, one possibility, is that shelter dogs, as it were, lack the gene for understanding people. Right? That might be why they're at the shelter. They might have ended up at the shelter precisely because they don't know how to live with people. And if that were the case, then any outcome prognosis would be very, very negative. Right? But let's see. Let's explore. So, some people said, maybe the dogs at the shelter were frightened of you. I haven't been giving you the really slow version where I give you every methodological detail. We did do some things prior to starting testing to try and ensure that the shelter dogs were not afraid of us. But maybe what we did was inadequate. It seemed adequate, but maybe it was inadequate. Um, oh yeah, that's, that's the animation that illustrates. Uh, that's quite Why do shelter dogs do so bad? Well, one possibility is they're fire dogs. Oh, 
How do I end the video? Um, oh, they just click on it. They don't look like they're frightened, but you know, an impression is not a scientific test. This is Nicole Dory, who also helped us on this research. You know, looks like a happy dog, so who am I to say? Some people said, well, maybe the dogs don't like your treats. How many of you have been to a shelter and tried giving a dog a treat? <laughs> shelter dogs have a particularly boring diet. They are pretty grateful for any kind of treat. That's Monty Dell giving this pup a treat. They seem very keen on our treats. But these impressions don't add up to science. We need to think, what kind of an experiment can we do? And the critical question here is, are these dogs redeemable? That's what really matters, right? It doesn't matter so much why they fail, except insofar as that contributes to understanding whether we can help them. So, we designed an experiment, Monty Cudell and I, and Nicole Dory. It's a little bit complicated, but I think we can do it. Let's take seven dogs. And let's test each of those seven shelter dogs the same way that the first group of shelter dogs were tested. Give them 10 opportunities, five to the left, five to the right, randomized, jumbled up. They fail. All seven of them fail. Now, let's just keep going. I describe this to you as a test, but actually, I don't know where you are in your learning theory lectures, it's not really, strictly speaking, a test. It's actually a learning trial. Because every correct response is reinforced, and every incorrect response is, if not exactly punished, it at least means you missed out on the reinforcement. So we expect animals to be able to learn that, right? It's conditioning. So we give them 10 trials to start with. I'm not going to show you the data from the 10 trials. I'm just telling you not a single one of these dogs succeeded, just like the first group of shelter dogs. Now we keep going. We keep going. And we keep going. And we're willing to go for up to 40 trials. When I say we, I mean Monique Fidel and Carl Dory. <laughs> we're willing to go for 40 trials which we expect it to take about half an hour. If the shelter dogs are genetically deficient in their ability to understand human beings, they will never succeed. And so this graph, which shows you how many trials it took to train the dog to go where we point, will just be 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, because they will all just max out. But in point of fact, the very first dog we brought out mastered this task in seven trials. And it took eight minutes to give that dog seven trials. Okay, go back, get another dog. That next dog also needed seven trials, which, because it's not like we were doing this to a stopwatch, it happened to run a little bit faster. It happened to take six minutes to train the second dog through seven trials. Third dog, actually the third dog did fail. The third dog received 40 trials, which took 29 minutes and was still failing at the end. But in fact, that was the only dog that failed. All the other dogs succeeded in within 40 trials. So that in fact, on average, we could take a shelter dog that didn't know what the pointing gesture meant, and we could teach that dog to go where we point in an average of just around 20 trials, which on average only took us about 10 minutes. Now, I say that, but have I proved that? Have I proved that these shelter dogs could be trained in 10 minutes? Or is it the alternative possibility, the alternative possibility is that these dogs just needed 10 more minutes opportunity to play with us, and that our initial assessment that we had relaxed them was incorrect, and that the dogs, if they just had a little extra time to relax and play with us, they would show us that they knew how to do this. So we take a second group of dogs, and we yoke each dog in the second group to one dog in the first group. So second dog A is initially tested for 10 trials and failed, and then is brought out and played with for eight minutes. <coughs> and after those eight minutes of extra playtime, second dog A is now entered into training, and the question is, does eight extra minutes of playtime lead to faster learning? And the answer is, doesn't look like it. Second dog A actually needed more trials, not fewer. What about second dog B? Second dog B gets played with for six minutes. Second dog B needed about the same number of trials. Second dog C was played with for 29 minutes, 
and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on, and on average, there is absolutely no difference in the performance. So in other words, I can say with some confidence that the dogs at the shelter fail, not because they are genetically incapable of understanding human beings, not because we didn't play with them for long enough, but quite definitely because they have not had adequate experience in the immediate past, at least, of people using their limbs to indicate where important things lie. So there's nothing magical about your dog's ability to read your actions, your gestures, your movements. Your dog lives in a human home, utterly and completely dependent on human action for everything of biological significance in his or her life. I now have, I have a now 12-year-old son, and it's been interesting following my son's development, behavioral development, alongside a dog's behavioral development. <laughs> so, okay, my dog is actually much younger than my son. But those of you that have a 12-year-old dog, how many of you have a 12-year-old dog that when it gets hungry can open the fridge or the kitchen cabinet and open whatever bags, containers we keep food in, and ensure that it gets out to eat. Okay, there is one. There's always one. But by and large, we don't expect our dogs to have the ability to help themselves to food, and indeed, in a typical household, a dog would be punished for helping itself. Whereas once children, we expect them to gradually acquire the ability to feed themselves. If you don't have a doggy door, your dog has no way of relieving itself without getting your attention and negotiating access through you to a space where urination and defecation will be tolerated. <laughs> My son has been able to operate the bathroom and all of its facilities for some years now. And so all of your dog's basic needs in life are mediated by you. Pet dogs' needs in life are mediated by human beings. You are your dog's project. Your dog has nothing else to do in life but to follow what you're doing and try and detect any patterns of correlation between your actions and outcomes that are important for him or her. So your dog is prime in prime location to become conditioned to any action of I mean, this great big pointing action is just at the extreme end of very overt, very obvious actions that can lead, that can imply the location of things of importance. But in all likelihood, when I do talks to the lay public, I have people come up afterwards, and they have all sorts of fantastical stories about their dog's mind reading. And some of them, of course, are just, you know, out of the fairies. But <laughs> some of them are actually making careful observations. So I think that my dog can tell when I get up from my desk when I'm working at home, whether I'm going to uh, make coffee or use the bathroom, things that are of no relevance to my dog, or more likely, can I put my shoes on and go outside? And I'm not aware that my manner of stepping up from my desk chair is different depending on where I'm going, but I think it probably is. And I think my dog, with nothing really else to do but to just stare at me and try and tell <laughs> any patterns of correlation between my behavior and outcomes she can do this. She can do this. So our dog achieves a tremendous subtlety of reaction to what we're to what we're about. Um, and insofar as shelter dogs lack those skills, our research shows that uh, nine times out of ten, uh, that's just lack of recent relevant experience. Now, there's a value in working with shelter dogs that we care about what's happening to them and we want to understand how to help them. But there's also a drawback in that I don't really know where these dogs come from. The cage cards will say things like owner surrender, found on the street, but that is not reliable enough to really be any use in a scientific project. So I don't entirely know, well I don't know, how long, well, what, whether these dogs were really ever established in human families, whether they were moved around from family to family, which might disrupt their ability to detect what people are doing. So I don't, I don't have as much information as I would like to have, um, but certainly we can get some. Okay. Right. 
So, it's funny looking at this slide, but I wrote on here one quarter of shelter dogs are euthanized, and then another report, somebody made the claim that one half of shelter dogs are euthanized. It's interesting how we just don't really know. You know certainly in the United States, where uh, county shelters, there how many counties are there in the United States? I don't know, it's been thousands and thousands and thousands, and each one has its own policy, and there's no centralization of records. But whatever the numbers are, it's an enormous number. And so my students and I have done a number of projects uh, looking at looking at ways to improve the behavior of shelter dogs and help them to get adopted. And I'll tell you about a little bit of that. And this is particularly the work of Sasha Protopola, who has spent four successive Florida summers going out to the county shelter every day doing either some kind of behavioral training or some kind of behavioral recording. It's an immense project with hundreds of dogs. The first project that Sasha did was modeled on one that uh, was done by um, Andrew Lucia at Purdue University Medical School, which, uh, which has become quite well known among people who manage shelters. And what uh, Lucia and Medlock did was they went out to the shelter and they trained the dogs to act nice. And they claimed to find that the dogs that were trained to act nice, like sitting and so on, that those dogs got adopted at a faster pit, at a higher rate than untrained dogs. Shelters have heard about this, and a lot of shelters are trying to put some effort into training dogs to act nice. Sasha and I had, we thought this was very interesting, very original, very thought provoking, but we also had some concerns about it. And in particular, we weren't that convinced that people cared so much about dog sitting. We worked on a hunch that the, oh, the potential owners would be more influenced by what would appear to be emotionally engaging behaviors rather than just obedient behaviors. And the other concern we had was that in the Lucia of Mental study, the shelter staff trained the dogs. And if you watch people go into shelters to choose a dog, um, there's it's, a, it's not an expensive purchase, but it's a purchase with massive ramifications. So people are very nervous. And it seemed to us that, accustomed as we are to shopping in the United States, we're looking to somebody to kind of like push something onto us, to help us a lot. So we were concerned that if you engage the shelter staff in the training program, the shelter staff might, perhaps unwittingly, somewhat encourage you to pick up the dogs that they've invested a lot of effort. So we designed a study where the dogs are trained to look at you lovingly. <laughs> they are trained by our people, university students. The shelter staff are not involved and are not informed as to what's going on or which dogs are in the program and in which condition. And uh, we also had a control condition, which Lucia and Medlock didn't really have in, the, in this way in that we had a second group of dogs who received the same number of treats as the dogs who were trained, but they were not trained to do anything while they were receiving these treats. And we had a left-behind group who were just left behind. Now we look at the adoption outcomes, and yippee, the trained group are adopted at a higher rate than the simply fed group, and they are adopted at a higher rate than the control group. But my yippee lacks sincere enthusiasm because the effect is tiny, 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 tiny. It is not statistically significant, which wouldn't bother me personally, uh, like analyzing statistics. But what does matter is that the difference, the improvement, is just a couple of percent. And when you consider the hours of training that went into achieving that couple of percent not statistically significant improvement, you can work out that no shelter in its right mind should adopt this program. We cannot advocate our own program. And so we were sort of disappointed, but it also, it also forced us to reconsider the approach we were taking. And we realized that there's a lot of luck and chance and intuition goes into the design of a study like this, or a study like Lucia and Medlock. In that, Lucia and Medlock's intuition was that people will like dogs that sit. Our intuition was people will like dogs that look at them. But where do we get these ideas from? 
who, who had the right to say that? What was completely missing from this branch of science was any attempt to just watch the dogs at the shelter and see what they do spontaneously and then see whether anybody cares about that. And so the following summer, having spent all of one summer going to the shelter every day and training dogs, the following summer, Sasha and Legion, an army of undergraduates, mainly pre-vet, um, we knew that people, when they go to the shelter to look for a dog, spend only from 30 to 70 seconds looking at each dog in the cage before they decide they want to move along and look at the next one. So, every day, for six months, a legion of people went out to the Alachua County Animal Shelter with small video cameras and just stood for 60 seconds holding the video camera at their chest high and made a short video of whatever the dog chose to do to this visitor who, so far as the dog can tell, might have been a doctor, potentially a doctor, right? So we ended up, there were 350 dogs in the study, they were videoed every day that they were in the shelter, so we ended up with thousands and thousands of these videos, and then we have an ethogram. Now, do you know what an ethogram is? So we have a list, it's just a shopping list of behaviors. We have a list of behaviors, and now, that's the, so six months of summer making the videos, six months of the winter having people sit in front of these videos and every time the dog sniffs its butt, they press one key on the keyboard that means dog sniffing its butt. And every time the dog wags its tail, they press another key on the keyboard that means dog wagging its tail. And now so we have all the behaviors that all of the dogs did and we can compare that to the dog's outcomes. And we can see whether there's anything that the dogs spontaneously do that helps them get out or seals their fate as euthanasia. And what's the next slide? Okay. So the first thing that comes out is that, well actually this is still really, really hard study, I'm sorry. Uh, this is not new news. Some, the, some breeds of dog get out much easier than other breeds of dog. So uh, pit bulls at the time the shelter was working um, and euthanizing basically half of all pit bulls, uh, but other breeds of dog are much more likely to be adopted. The reason I need to mention that is because when we come to look at the behavior, it turns out to be very important that we distinguish between what we feel we should call morphologically preferred dogs, which just basically means cute, and morphologically unpreferred, which in the North Florida context means pit bull. So we've got, to, we've got to have that distinction. Um, and so cute dogs get adopted faster, um, more likely to be adopted than ugly dogs. And we actually showed people photographs of the dogs that have been adopted and the dogs that have been euthanized uh, without the people who were seeing the photographs knowing what these dogs, whatever became of these dogs. And uh, people do definitely notice that uh, adopted dogs are cuter than Okay, that's that. All right, so here's the video. Here's a brief segment of video. This is what a random dog looks like. And a random dog looks like when you come up to look at him, make a short video of him, and he's just being given an opportunity to do whatever he wants to do. And so the question is, look, here he is, a bit of barking, tail wagging, he's staying at the front, ears are up, I don't know, all sorts of things, ears back. Um, are any of these behaviors predictive of his fate? And so let's move on. And, uh, all right. So first of all, so we're looking here, by this year, the shelter has more or less given up euthanasia. And so as our measure of outcome, we're going to take length of stay. We want dogs to have shorter lengths of stay. And so when we just consider the cute dogs, it turns out that nothing correlates very much with length of stay. It's just like real life. If you're cute, you can get away with almost anything. <laughs> there are a couple of exceptions. Back of kennel correlates with length of stay. If you're hiding in the back, how can people know you're cute? You've got to come up and let people see that you're cute, right? And uh, growling correlates with length of stay. Even if you're cute, don't be mean sounding, right? Okay, if you're cute, Nothing much correlates with length of stay. 
But that's already really useful information for a shelter that wants to do better and get its dogs adopted. You have limited resources. Don't waste your time investing them in the cute dogs. You don't need to train cute dogs to do anything. They're going to walk out the door so long as they don't growl and they don't hide in the back. But now you look at the ugly dogs, everything above the dash line correlates with length of stay. The highest correlation is dirtiness. If you're ugly, keep your digs clean. Right? Uh, don't rub the wall, and so on and so on. A whole bunch of things. Um, I don't have that on here, do I? But uh, um, it's not shown on that slide. But interestingly, sit, which is what uh, Lucia and Medlock train dogs to do, in this population of dogs, sitting didn't correlate with length of stay. From this population of dogs, there would appear to be no purpose in teaching them to sit, because in fact, it's not predicting their outcome. Teach them if you can to keep their their kennels clean and uh, uh, not to lick and not to jump and so on. Those would be useful. All right. I wonder whether it's worth going into this. Oh, um, so I have I have about seven minutes to the hour, but I'd like to leave a little bit of time for questions. So, all right, let me, let me try and give you a quick version of this. If I only show you a little bit of it, it still might be interesting to you. So, this is now getting out of the shelter and considering dog behavior problems. Dog behavior problems are a major reason why people abandon their dogs. If your dog is too much bother, you give it up. And uh, where I was at the University of Florida, a very strong applied behavior analysis group. Applied behavior analysis is a school of helping people with behavioral problems that stems from the principles of animal learning. And so you have principles of animal learning and conditioning, and certain scientists in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s took those principles and started using them to develop behavioral therapies, which have been especially successful with people who are not working. If you have somebody who can talk, there are other forms of therapy that work more quickly. But if you have somebody who doesn't have much of a capacity for language, then really reward and punishment is all you have to go on with those people. And one of my colleagues at Florida, Brian Owazi, was the inventor of a very powerful technique, which he calls functional analysis, which is a technique that's been used thousands and thousands of times, particularly with autistic children who have little or no language capacity and have behavioral problems. And I went to so many seminars by Brian's students where they discussed a child who had the tendency to bang their head on a table, or uh, cut themselves, or just be just break out into a yelling, screaming fit. And these behaviors appear to come out of nowhere, and there's nothing you can say to this individual to get them to stop, because they don't understand people's language. And so Brian developed this technique based on the assumption that whatever these undesired behaviors are, they are being reinforced by something in the individual's environment. And it's a very simple technique. It involves putting the person into a very limited environment where you can completely control whatever is going on there. And you wait for them to produce this undesired behavior, and you provide a consequence for it. And so, for example, you this is a typical case of this functional analysis, an individual called Nelly who is producing the behavior of being disruptive in a remedial classroom that Nelly has been assigned to. And uh, you very strictly control what's going on. So sometimes when Nelly is disruptive, you provide escape from the ongoing task. So Nelly is expected to carry out some task, but if she produces disruptive behavior, she's excused from the task. That may sound like an odd thing to do, but it actually comes fairly natural to teachers or people in control of a remedial classroom that if somebody is banging their head on the desk, you cease asking them to continue with the task. So escape is actually not an uncommon consequence. Um, control means you provide no program consequences. If Nelly is going to do this disruptive behavior, you just ignore her and let her get on with it. And attention. Attention 
saying it would technically take the form of some saying something like, Nelly, stop doing that. Stop doing that now. Nelly, please stop doing that. And it seems paradoxical, but this functional analysis of a disruptive child is actually very typical. That the behaviors that we spontaneously produce to an individual who's doing something we don't want them to are actually precisely the consequences that reinforce that behavior. Since Nelly has only a very poor grasp of language, the fact that the words that are being said to her are negative and chastising is not very important. What matters is that the teacher has turned her attention towards that one individual. And having somebody in, of importance pay attention to you can be very reinforcing, very sustaining of behavior. So I have this colleague and I have his students every week presenting some other case study about using this kind of technique. And it was actually Sasha Prokopopo who said to me, couldn't we take this technique and try it on undesired behaviors of dogs? The point being that if we could figure out what it is in the environment that sustains the undesired behavior, we might be able to stop that consequence and perhaps cure the behavior. So we haven't done very much of this yet, but we've, I've got one case study that Nathan Hall and Sasha did together. Paisley is a three-year-old boxer who has a life-chasing compulsion. So bad, I mean, it sounds like just a funny sort of thing. You could just wave, wave your laser pointer and have your dog dance. That would be okay. But actually, it's a serious behavioral problem. And Paisley broke a tooth because he was charging after a ray of light, a reflection of a windscreen of a car driving past, and just crashed into some furniture and broke one of his teeth. And um, he even cannot wear his uh, standard dog tag because it can catch a reflection, you know, the light can be reflected off the dog tag onto a wall or something, and Paisley will chase after it and break things in the house. And so Sasha and Nathan set up uh, three simple conditions. One is control, where nothing happens. One is movement. So you're going to see Nathan holding a light, and every time Paisley goes for the light, Nathan's going to move it a bit. And the third is removal, where every time Paisley goes for the light, Nathan's going to turn it off. And so, uh, by the interest of time, I won't show you the videos. You can just believe me that uh, you can see very clearly that if the light gets moved around, Paisley is really engaged with it. If the light is removed, oh, that one starts automatically. If the light is removed, then Paisley actually howls for a moment and then stops. And in the, I didn't have a video during the So we ascertain that Paisley's light chasing is reinforced by the movement of the light. Then what can we do for a treatment? We train an incompatible behavior. We train Paisley to wave on command. And I'm just going to show you that he's, yeah, okay. So he's reinforced primarily by movement of the light. Now we train Paisley to wave. Waving is incompatible with chasing. You can't wave and chase at the same time. So we've trained an incompatible behavior. And now we bring the incompatible behavior under control of the stimulus that creates the problem. So we train Paisley to wave to the command wave and then to wave to a light. And so if we do that, then we create a dog who, instead of chasing a light, waves to a light. And although waving to a light may be a peculiar eccentricity, it's not a behavioral problem. So it's just one dog. It's not, you know, it's not like a treatment that I can offer you to take home and use with clients. But it's the beginnings of a new way of looking at dog problem behaviors, a behavior analytic, applied behavior analysis approach to dog behavior problems. So uh, here's some data that show that initially, paw lifting never occurred spontaneously, pouncing like did occur spontaneously, <coughs> but then we imposed some training, we increased the rate of poor lifting, the rate of pouncing is not removed, reduced just by the fact of training, but with the imposition of the treatment, the rate of pouncing goes down as the rate of poor lifting goes up. So it seemed to be a useful treatment for that one dog. So, in the interest of having time to take some questions, I'll just list for you other things that my group and I work on. One thing which I consider my hobby, in the sense that it's clearly not part of the job of being a professor of behavioral psychology, 
is that I'm fascinated in the story of the origin of dogs. I very vaguely said dogs arose from wars 15,000 years ago. That turns out to be an amazingly controversial minefield of work of geneticists and archaeologists. I find absolutely fascinating. Dogs as mitigators of stress in children. We're doing a project funded by the National Institute on Child Health and Human Development looking at whether having your dog with you, if you're a child, helps you buffer stress. And the short answer is no. A long answer as well. Interventions to reduce return of adopted dogs to shelters. It's one thing to get people to adopt dogs, but some large minority of dogs that are adopted actually just get given straight back to the shelter. And so we're just starting a pro program in Arizona to see what we can do to improve the formation of the human dog bond so that not so many dogs get returned. Enrichment for captive wolves, wolf dogs, and behavioral differences between dogs. All right, so I'll stop there. Uh, questions, please. No? Okay. Yeah. Thank you.